Aloha, and on behalf of Papa Ola Lokahi, uh, my name is Kim Kuule Bernie. Welcome to this webinar come podcast on Hawaiian Genomics 101. Uh, we have two really we have some we have two smart moderators and two really smart panelists, and I'll let them take care of all of that programming issues. Um, let's go into. Are we going to wait for Emmett to do this? Go ahead, Kim. All right. This is for Dr. Aluli. We'll start with Naomakua. Naomakua Maikala Yakala Ko. Maikaho Okuya. Naomakua Yakala Yakahina Kua Yakahina. Maikala Ko Ikalani. Hi, Kalani. Mahalo. All right. Um, you want you want to go with this one, Joanne? Sure. Oh, podcast until we can actually see your faces. So just a few housekeeping uh, tips that this webinar is being recorded. Um, uh, so you all of you attendees know that. If you're not already muted, please do mute yourselves. Um, as we said earlier, we are having some technical difficulties in that we cannot see all of the panelists faces right now. And I'm hoping that uh, we can go ahead and start this broadcast and uh, maybe make some adjustments and make that change. But we're going to go ahead and get started anyway. The panelists cannot see you, but they can see the questions and answers. Um, they will be able to see the questions and the answers. Uh, our two panelists will be presenting and then we'll be taking questions both on Zoom and also through Facebook. Please post the questions in the Q&A box. Um, throughout the presentation, we will be sprinkling different present, uh, uh, different links to some of the most relevant uh, research articles and presentations about Hawaiian genomics, about all of us and other related topics. Uh, if you're not familiar with links in your chat box, just simply click on the link, it'll open up in your browser and you can tend to it later. You don't even have to have two screens or three screens. Just click on it, it'll open up and you can get it later. Um, and finally, at the end of this presentation, there will be an evaluation and we invite you to complete that evaluation. If you don't do so immediately, uh, it'll be sent to the Zoom registrants tomorrow. Um, and you'll have another chance. For those that are watching via Facebook, we can get you an evaluation. We'll post that information later. 
So now without further delay, and mahalo to everybody for your patience and understanding today, I'll turn this over to um, our moderators, Dr. Noah Amadaluli and, Do and Joanne Sark. Well, okay, so first of all, I just want to welcome everybody and I just want to thank the uh, sponsors, especially um, uh, the Kaukahui, the Native Hawaiian Physicians Association, along with uh, Papa Oluakahi and uh, Ahakani. And, um, you know, just some introduction points. This is genomic science is a new frontier for us health researchers. Um, and it, it provides an important tool for personalizing healthcare delivery. Um, it's a new topic, but that uh, has been quiet for about at least uh, 20 years. Um, in 2003, Papa Olokai conducted uh, a number of community sessions because we became aware of a study of a rare genetic disease in a large Hawaiian family. Uh, there was also talk at our UH from a research faculty about mapping the Hawaiian genomes. Um, there was also concern about bioprospecting with Hawaiian la'au and other environmental um, elements. Um, there was a consortium of Kumuhulu who had issued a statement, a declaration Hi, this is Joanna. I'm going to pick up where Emmett left off until he can join us again. Emmett, I'm not sure if you're muted, but um, back about 20 years ago, there was a lot of talk about biospecimens, biospecimen collections, mapping the Hawaiian genome. And in all honesty, we were not prepared for that conversation. We'd not been included in any of the discussions about this. And so we held a number of meetings in the community to talk about this, how did people feel and uh, what we could do about it. And we realized that we didn't even know some of the questions to ask. The Ilio Ula Okalani uh, Consortium uh, put together the Paul Kalani Declaration. And I believe Dr. Leah Dalsit is gonna address some of that. But it was really a statement talking about concerns we had about these kinds of studies or the lack of transparency and not being included. And so at the time we put a moratorium or different groups said, you know, let's stop this until we understand more about it. So at the meetings that we held, we raised a number of issues and concerns, of course, being left out of the conversation and this lack of transparency on the part of researchers, not including us or not, um, being transparent about what they were doing. We, we were aware that we were unprepared to have that discussion. That's not the case today. Um, but there were outcomes from that discussion. Papa Ololoka, he was in the process of setting up a Native Hawaiian Healthcare Systems Institutional Review Board because we were anticipating research from a NIH study that we had funded. We did a number of multiple surveys asking Native Hawaiians, telephone surveys, and those have been published and you'll get links to that, asking Hawaiians how they felt about banked tissue. Did they know they had banked tissue if they had been in a surgery in a hospital and about the use of that tissue for research? Uh, we worked with the Queens uh, Medical Center in their cancer center, um, outpatient center, and they adopted new protocols for use of banked tissue, offering patients choices of what to do with that and some control over that. So today now there are new issues because there are new studies. And it's also something I know Dr. Fox would talk about and that's the business behind biospecimen collections. And I think there'll be some nice insights for all of us, uh, but there are new issues about open source data banks, about the commodification of the biospecimen. And again, Science is science, but if we don't have access to the benefits of science, we have to question who benefits in the end and who protects and are caretakers of this information. But what has changed is we have Kanaka Maoli expertise and you're gonna hear from them shortly. Um, 
And I'm so excited because this is something we've been planning for about eight months and, and the COVID-19 sort of sidetracked us, but it's time to visit this. And I think you'd be really excited about um, what our two speakers have to say. So Emmett, are you gonna do introductions? Can you hear me? Yep. Well, uh, so um, we have two great panelists and, and uh, first one is Leah Wang Dossett. Um, Hawaiian name is Keala Aumoe. She is an assistant clinical professor of pediatrics at the John A. Byrne School of Medicine, University of Hawaii, and a clinical genesis, I mean, gen genesis at Hawaii Community and Generics. Um, she is board certified in pediatrics and medical geriatrics and genomics. Her clinical focus includes general genetics, uh, dysmorphology, and inborn errors of metabolism. Her primary research focus uh, on improving uh, genomic health disparities in underrepresented minority populations, Native Hawaiian health, and expanding the availability of genomic sequencing and phenotype information to her patients and families. Um, Dr. Dowsett is proud to serve on the board of Ahuhui Onakauka, a rising star. Um, this also um, acknowledges her dad, uh, Jerry Wang, uh, Dr. Jerry Wang, biostatistician, who helped us in the early days of our community-based participatory research. Okay, and yes, big shout out to Dr. Jerry Wang. He really helped us with our learning curve as we were getting into research and, you know, provided so much pro bono time to help us um, in the research enterprise. So I have the honor of introducing Dr. Keolu Fox. Uh, we have not met in person, but we've had a number of Zoom meetings and, and phone calls. And I, I'm so excited with our two panelists, but Dr. Fox is, uh, his research program is multidisciplinary in nature, reflecting on his interdisciplinary research experience in anthropology, genomics, and computer science. Uh, explores links between human genetic variation and disease in underrepresented populations, and research focus on people of Polynesian descent. He's a postdoc research at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine. And really important, he is an awesome advocate for more exclusion and representative genome secrecy. So allow, to allow indigenous populations to gather and analyze their own genetic data. This has been the mantra of Hawaiians in research inclusion. Um, Keolu's current project focuses on genome editing technologies, and he'll tell you more about that. But interestingly, as I was learning more and more about Keolu's work is that he's really has an international media spotlight and has been recognized um, in multiple outlets like Wired, BBC, National Public Radio, The Atlantic, Forbes, and his most recent um, publication in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled The Inclusion, the, I'm sorry, The Illusion of Inclusion, the All of Us Research Program and Indigenous Peoples DNA. So, um, so for over the last eight and nine months, I'm so happy this has come to fruition. Uh, Kelu has been a real leader and advocate for Native-led solutions. And I know he works internationally with some of the folks who have helped us over the past years in genetic studies and issues. And so, um, you know, this is another frontier and we have to learn about it and learn to ask the questions that are important, not just about genomics, the science, but genomics, the politics and the business around it. And we have two great speakers who can help us learn more about it. So I'm honored to hand this over to our panelists. And I think we're gonna begin with Leah, correct? Right. Again, thank you so much. Those introductions were incredible. And um, you know, both Kilu and I are just so humbled to be able to share our passion for genetics and genomics with our Lahui today. Um, and then hopefully somebody's gonna queue up 
the slides. Ah, oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so um, next, please. Perfect. And again, none of this would have been possible without all of the support from these groups. So Malo Piha, um, next, please. Great. So sorry, one more. So this is our outline for today. And we're going to go over some basic definitions. Um, as you can see, you know, we can all agree that race, ethnicity, and ancestry are often used interchangeably, but they can mean different things to different people. So race refers to the categories that reflect the major divisions of humankind, Caucasians, Africans, Asians. Um, and race data is really key to implementing many federal laws to monitor compliance. So things um, such as assessing fairness of employment practices, monitoring racial disparities and characteristics such as health and education, being able to plan and obtain funds for public services, right? That is something that you know we, we look towards. Ethnicity emphasizes the cultural, religious and political qualities of human groups. And this can encompass language and diet and customs. Um, you know, we look to state and local governments who monitor compliance with anti-discrimination provisions, right? We always see this question being asked, are you Hispanic or Latino, right? To help administer bilingual programs for people of Hispanic origin, as an example. Ancestry can be defined geographically, right? Are you from Asia or from Europe or from Sub-Saharan Africa. It can also be defined geopolitically, right? If you're Vietnamese or Norwegian, or it can also be defined culturally, right? If you identify as Navajo or Afsubai. Um, ancestry is one of those things that can be assigned by an observer, self-identified from a checklist, or better yet, obtained through genetic data analyses. So I wanted to highlight this term, underrepresented minority, or URM for short, and um, you know, specific to ancestry, the National Institute of Health defines an underrepresented minority as someone who identifies as African American, American Indian, or Alaskan Native. We fall into this category as Kanakamoli, right? Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders, and if you're Hispanic or Latino. So just to recap, you know, race, ethnicities are all complex ideas, and I just wanted to, you know, lay some groundwork. Next, please. Perfect. So on to some background. Next, sorry, <laughs> I have plenty of slides, but they're all really succinct. Okay, um, because this is a census year, I wanted to be able to kind of delve into a little bit about the history of how the National Institute of Health now kind of views the racial and ethnic categories. And of course, um, what that looks like in a census year from the US Census Bureau's perspective. Next, please. Thank you. Um, like I'd mentioned before, five racial categories and one ethnic category. One more time. So for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander category, again, a person having any origins in any of the original peoples of Hawaii, Guam, Samoa, or the other Pacific Islands is what it's intended to capture. Um, one more if can. Thank you. The U.S. Census Bureau has been keeping track of the ancestral subpopulations in America since 1790. Um, and if you could advance them just a couple, I had some arrows and stuff, but oh, I'm so bad for all the animation. Yeah, can't keep going. So back then, we only had three categories. Back in 1790, there was just free whites, free non-whites, and slaves. You know, fast forwarding, to the future right here. Oh, trickle back one to 1850, I'm so sorry. So this is looking more at pre-American Civil War times in this country. Again, only looking at options for free inhabitants and we're only talking again, three more categories, right? White, black, and mulatto. Okay, now we can go to that one. Yeah, perfect. Fast forward 130 years and you can see that there is more diversity. However, in 1980, you can see Hawaiian is on there, but you were instructed that you could only specify one. So for someone like myself, who's of mixed ancestry, right? Who's, you know, Hawaiian, Chinese, Caucasian, you were limited to just one choice. Next. So this is a map of what the United States of, you know, America looks like. Um, and for the continent, I wanna go over the ancestry with the largest population by state. You can see that in purple, we have a lot of African-American representation uh, in the South. We also have pink representing our Mexican-Americans and Puerto Ricans. Uh, orange are our other indigenous groups here in America, like the Alaska natives and Native Americans. 
And then here in Hawaii, you can see that we are, are white. And what is white? Uh, in the other category that encompasses pretty much everything we are, we're Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, you name it. Um, that is what Hawaii is representative of. And you can see that we're very unique when compared to the rest of the country. Um, what's interesting I want to note is that if you look in the um, on the right with all the different kind of ancestry breakdown, you can see that Caucasians are broken down into English, Finnish, Dutch, French, German, Irish, Norwegian, what have you. But you know, for people like us, we're just kind of clumped all into other. The millennium, right in 2000, it marks the first time that you're actually allowed to mark down on census that you are more than one race yet. Sorry, if you can advance, please. Thank you. In one of the most diverse countries in the world, one more time, in our last census, only 2% of the non-Hispanic Americans chose to identify as such. And not surprisingly, as you can see, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders made up the vast majority. Okay, next one. So this year in our census, um, yeah, one more, can. I just wanna highlight that we have you know, our own checkbox, right? And if you identify as Native Hawaiian perfect, it's there for you to find. Other examples though are listed above, right? Things like Chamorro and Tongan, Palau and Tokelau, and they're all there. So we can also choose more than one race by which to identify. Um, next, please. So we've seen how different institutions categorize ancestry differently. And I just want this to kind of give you guys some perspective about how, you know, in terms of scientific studies that are occurring across, you know, the continent at this very moment, we really don't have a consensus of how to extract that meaningful data. So sometimes, you know, we have people who don't really know their heritage, right, if they're adopted, for example. And so Kilo and I would like to kind of maybe discuss this more later in the series. But moving forward, as a field in genetics and genomics, we just need to be cognizant of biologic ancestry and how it relates to, to science. All right, one more. So today we're gonna to be taking a conceptual overview of the amazing facility of DNA, right? We're gonna talk about how it works, what is a genome, what does that look like, and how we can translate research from the bench to our own health and well-being. Next, please. So what is genomics, right? An organism's complete set of DNA is called its genome. And genomics is the study of all of a person's genes. And it also includes the interactions of those genes with each other and with the environment. Our bodies are so cool. They're comprised of over 1 trillion cells, right? So we start off with the egg and the sperm coming together and that one cell divides and divides and divides until we have over 1 trillion. And virtually every single cell in our body contains a complete copy of approximately 3 billion DNA base pairs or letters that make up our genome. With its four letter language, DNA contains the information that's needed to build the entire human body. And we have that information packaged up into 23 pairs of chromosomes that are in the nucleus of every cell. The genes are what direct the production of proteins. And it's estimated that we have over 20,000 genes or instructions in our bodies. And it's the proteins, right, that make up body structures like organs and tissue, as well as control chemical reactions, carry signals from cells. The point here is that if a cell's DNA is mutated and an abnormal protein is produced, that can disrupt the body's usual process and lead to a disease such as cancer. Next, please. So what is DNA? DNA is the chemical compound, again, that we use to kind of do all of our instructions. It stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And the molecules are made up of a twisting paired strand, which is referred to as the double helix. Each strand is made up of four chemical units. That's kind of like our genetic alphabet. The letters are A, T, G and C, and it's the order of these letters that determines the meaning of information that's encoded in that part of our DNA molecule. So just like when you're reading a book, the order of the letters determines the meaning of a word. Um, next, thank you. Genes, what are they? Well, they're in the instructions or the recipes that tell our bodies how to grow and develop. We have two copies of every gene. We inherit one copy of genes from our mom, the other from our dad, and a gene could be as short as a few hundred base pairs or letters or as long as many thousands. So as an example, the BRCA1 gene, which is related to breast and ovarian cancer, that's hereditary, is it's huge. It's over 80,000 letters long. Ah, next. 
So this is what our chromosomes look like and what are they, right? They're these squiggly things. And again, in every cell in our bodies, this is how our genetic information is packaged up. We have 23 pairs, numbers one through 22. They are numbered from big to small. And the last set, the 23rd set kind of shows us, you know, if you're male or female. Perfect, we can advance. So what is gene sequencing? Sequencing simply means that we're trying to determine the exact order of the bases in a strand of DNA. And researchers like Keolu can use DNA sequencing to look for genetic variations, or another word for that is mutations that may play a role in the development or progression of a disease. The disease causing change may be as big as the deletion of thousands of bases, right? Or it can be as small as a single letter change. Next, please. Thank you. So the cookbook analogy is something we use often in our work, in our clinic, and we describe the genome, right, the entire book, right, the playbook, all of the instructions. The book is the genome. We liken the different chapters in a book to what chromosomes represent, and then the genes are the individual recipes in that cookbook. So on a sequencing level, you can be missing a whole page, you can be missing a paragraph, you can be missing a sentence in your recipe, or even something as small as a simple spelling change like the word the, T-H-E, it could be T-E-H, and that single change alone could be important enough that when damaged or mutated can cause disease. Next. So this is DNA in a bookshelf. And in the photo above, you can see that there's a series of books and they're all stacked there. They were on display in London, but this is the very first printout of the human genome. There are again, over 3 billion units of DNA code and they have been collected into more than a hundred volumes, right? Each of those volumes that you see on that shelf is 1000 pages long. And you can see zoomed in on the right, how tiny the type is. It's barely legible. A person would have to type for eight hours a day for more than 50 years to complete this job of getting the human genome onto the bookshelf. However, a cell on average takes only eight hours to really copy the entire sequence. And I just, I think that's a beautiful example, right? Nature is just so efficient and the human body is so cool. Next. So people often ask me, what does a geneticist do exactly? And for the most part, I would consider myself a rare disease doctor. I help to diagnose and manage and treat patients with diseases that are often you know, hereditary or due to a genetic change in their DNA. Um, these are some of the things that we see in our clinic. For us, when we think about, you know, Keiki who come to our clinic, they could have intellectual disability or maybe, you know, a congenital heart defect or a seizure disorder. And they're trying to find out, is there something in the DNA that's causing it? We see adults in our clinic. We also see patients who have a family history of cancer or themselves have cancer. And we're trying to identify something hereditary in that aspect. Children who have metabolic disease, sometimes in the hospital, we have very, very sick babies that have a lot of different things going on. So they might call on a geneticist to try to figure out if we can tie it all together and find a diagnosis that's underlying everything. We do a lot of outreach to outer islands and we're doing a lot of telegenetics this, these days, as you know. Um, and of course, um, you know, test coordination is another thing because it's kind of expanding and a lot of you know, people in other subspecialty areas are looking for genetic testing. Um, that's something that we do. You know, beyond myself, I work with a wonderful team of support staff and medical assistants and genetic counselors. And I, I'm just so blessed to be able to work with these wonderful people every single day. It really is such a great job. And we work very tightly with the lab to kind of translate information from the testing that we do back to our patients. Next, please. So these are the things that we kind of test for and you can go to the next slide. And our goal is to provide a diagnosis or to help rule, in, rule out disease, um, patient surveillance and management recommendations for different disease conditions, right? We try to help you know, outline that. We also talk about risk or maybe screening other family members who might you know, be affected or carriers of a certain disease. And again, we're trying to get patients better services and better care. Next. So I know hopefully a lot of you in the 
audience are familiar with 23andMe and they are a direct-to-consumer company that does a lot of ancestry testing. They also dabble in um, you know, the medical side of things. And so one thing I wanted to point out was their BRCA testing. So for 23andMe, if you do you know, the medical risk that goes along with the ancestry testing, um, when looking at that gene, the BRCA1 gene that encodes, right, um, the instructions that have to do with the increased predisposition for breast and ovarian cancer, it only looks for three specific mutations that are common in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. So it occurs in about 2% of Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, but if you're, you know, a part of the general population and do not belong to that ancestry group, it's only a fraction of a fraction of a percent that might, you know, have this difference. Uh, if you're thinking of it like as the beads on a string model, so if we think about all these base pairs or letters as beads on a string, we know that the BRCA1 gene has 80,000 beads on it. This test only checks three out of those 80,000 beads. And so really, you know, the most common mutations that are in the population are not being looked at. Um, this test does not identify any of the thousand plus other known mutations in this gene that can cause breast cancer. And so, um, you know, when a patient comes into our office and says, oh, well, I've had a negative 23andMe breast cancer risk test, you know, it's really an incomplete test, right? Because these negative results do not rule out the possibility of cancer. And I think, you know, um, there's a lot of kanakamole who have done this testing for ancestry purposes and maybe have added on this added, you know, screening for other types of medical risks, breast cancer being one of them. And you know, there are a lot of people walking around out there thinking that they're healthy or that they don't have risk because their three spot out of 80,000 spot tests came back normal. And I think to me, this misinformation can be falsely reassuring and it's, it's quite dangerous, which is why involving you know, a genetic counselor or a geneticist or someone who's trained in genetics is, is really key. Next. In October, 2003, 17 years ago last week, one more if can, Thank you. Kanakomole of Kapai Aina Hawaii gathered at a Native Hawaiian property rights conference to express our collective right to self-determination and to perpetuate our culture under the threat of theft and commercialization of the traditional knowledge of, of our people, of our Vahipana, of Namea Hawaii. And the participants included, you know, different kinds of kumuhula, laolapa'au, artists, you know, academics, teachers, attorneys, and they created this declaration to prohibit the commercialization of our culture, as, as you know, Joanne had mentioned earlier. Uh, in Hawaii, the bioprospecting and biotechnology institution and industries that are imposing right, Western intellectual property rights over our traditional cultural land-based resources is you know, not okay. And so they have basically said that the biogenetic materials of our people that are taken for medical research, for things like breast cancer and other diseases that have been obtained through misrepresentation without the proper consent, right? These are viewed as acts of biopiracy and were condemned as acts of biocolonialism. Next, you know, we as um, Kanaka should have the right to inform consent. We have the right to rightful repatriation of the biologic or genetic samples that have been sold or patented or licensed. And I'm gonna leave that to Keolu to talk about in a little bit. Um, and again, you know, what's important here is that Kanakamole human genetic material, it, it's sacred and it's inalienable. And so I think, you know, putting a moratorium on that was, you know, important. Um, one more, please. I think what it all boils down to, like John was saying, was health equity. And you know the power of this genomic era is going to really transform our understanding of human disease. You know, I think our goal is to ensure that the maximum potential of these benefits of genomic sequencing applies to all people, right? That you know receive testing worldwide, not just to the haves or not just to the Caucasians who build all the databases. You know, um, I think on one hand, if you were to look at at my DNA, right, on the molecular level, you would have genetic markers that you know show that I share some similarities with other Kanapaoli and other peoples of Polynesia. But I think, you know, I also wanted to share that I also recognize that there is so much more to being Hawaiian than, you know, just my DNA. For me, it's knowing, you know, 
our mo'oku oho, connecting to our ancestors through sharing stories or song or dance. It's through perpetuating Hawaiian values by teaching, you know, my keiki about our culture, about the language. You know, Ke'olu and I realize these things and ensuring, you know, that genomic research involving Kanaka Mo'oli is just something that we have been tasked to focus on for this series. And I think with that, you know, I'm going to transition, right? My day-to-day -day work as a physician is taking care of, you know, the science and applying it to patient care. But Kiel is going to talk about the research side of things and all the great work that he's been doing in this arena. So, mahalo. So, so, um, <laughs> go ahead, Emmett. I think he got cut off, Kim. Um, thank you, Leah. <laughs> Gosh, I learned something every time. Thank you. It's so clear for me. Um, I, I want to move it on to um, Kiolu. And uh, when Emmett gets back on, we'll entertain his question for you after that. But uh, thank you so much, Leah. Uh, Kiolu, the floor is yours. Mahalo nui, everyone. Leah, that was excellent it is so lovely to get to speak to everyone to speak to the lahui about a lot of these developments that is uh the perfect background i should also say thank you to all the organizers for having us so we can have this conversation and continue this it's so exciting that we get to bring uh, our community multiple lectures on some really emerging issues not just the technology and the policy and the potential for the future of health in Hawaii, but, but also the cons and the, the potential ways that this, use, this information is misused. So I figured I'm gonna try the screen share now. You guys just let me know if it works. Okay, does it look like it's working? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I know, cool. Um, all right, so, that being said, I wanted to provide everyone with the mo'olelo of population genetics, the history of sort of how we got here. And then this talk will finally culminate at the end with one of the larger government scale initiatives that is attempting to utilize and sequence over a million people's genomes in the United States. And we're gonna have a very frank conversation about that. But first we have to really uh, lay the groundwork for the history of, of kind of two things, the, the technology and the policy and the sort of arms race between those two different avenues for development. So, um, well, where, oh, here we go. Okay, perfect. So uh, I just wanted to take stock of where we are in history right now at this moment in 2020 when we look at the history of genome sequencing and the communities that have been included, looking from 2005 to 2018, vast, the vast number of, of genomes that have been investigated are of individuals of Western European ancestry. So that means when, when we forecast and think about the future of predictive and preventative and personalized and precision, all the Ps, medicine, we start to see something emerge where, where this, this whole data set that is emerging does not reflect the diversity that we see in our everyday lives. Certainly not in, in Hawaii, which is a state that has the highest percentage of mixed ancestry people in the United States, including myself and many other Kanaka Ohana. So, so we have to take stock of that and ask questions like, how did we get here? How did this, this, this bias develop over time? What are the defining features of this? And this talk and the remainder of this talk and setting everyone up with the history with the Mo'olelo is rooted in the idea of right? We are walking backwards into the future. We are keeping our eyes on the decisions that have already been made 
the biases that have built in, the mistakes that have been made, the successes, the pros and the cons, and learning from this history of community-based science. And that's why it's so beautiful to be here with people that have been thinking about these issues uh, like, um, you know, Joanna and uh, Dr. Aluli for, you know, well before Leah and I were even born. So that is just <laughs> incredible. So thank you so much for the opportunity to, to take it from there. Um, so a little outline on some of the ideas we'll talk about. So we're going to go kind of on a way back journey on a trip. And we're going to first talk about the past, the lessons learned in the field of population genetics. We're going to talk about advancements in genetic technology. Chiefly, we're going to talk about genome sequencing. We're going to talk about improvements in bioethics policy over time. What, what moments in history have resulted in key features of policy that protect our rights and interests uh, and our data and how did we get there and then we'll talk about the present we'll take a critical look at the NIH's all of us research program and the pros and cons of large-scale government funded initiatives remember these are initiatives that are paid for with our tax paying dollars our hard-earned money then we'll kind of turn towards the future and we'll talk about performing culturally sustainable research with indigenous communities as partners and not subjects. What does that mean when indigenous communities lead genetic initiatives? What is indigenous data sovereignty? What does that mean to us? So for the remainder of this talk, you will see the double helix, this little symbol here, representing DNA, representing the technology development benchmarks. You will also see this little mallet here with the piece of paper that represents uh, legal proceedings and bioethical decisions that have been made over time. You'll see that technology moves much, much faster than science policy. So generally speaking, the, the, the policy is trying to keep up. And, uh, and I, I, it's very interesting to look at the history and, and what has happened over time. So our journey starts in 1977. Let's take a look. Two really important papers come out in 1977. One of them is a paper from this gentleman, Frederick Sanger, who's one of two individuals to win multiple Nobel prizes. One of them was for DNA sequencing with chain terminating inhibitors. He created a way to read the human genome in as a sequence. Another thing that happened, uh, you might have heard about genome editing, which has been the new, in the news later. We'll get to that in our third part of our lecture series when we're talking about the future. Uh, but this was a huge moment in, in something called re restriction enzymes and the idea that we can now kind of work towards genome engineering. So think about it as one tool to read the genome and one tool to begin to think about making adjustments to change typos, right? To adjust point mutations. Uh, on the bioethical side though, there was the Tuskegee experiments and the Belmont report. So a bunch of horrible experiments happened where uh, syphilis was allowed to take its natural course in, of course, black and African American communities. And this was completely unethical. It resulted in something though that's very important called the Belmont Report. And the Belmont Report is so important because it laid the groundwork for consent and it informed consent. And a lot of the pieces that we see develop around giving patients agency and rights around their genome and understanding it as their own property and their resource. So kind of setting precedent for that. Moving in from 1977 to 1990, we see the creation of the first automated genome sequencer. This gentleman, Lee Hood, uh, at Caltech University in 1986, creates this automated genome sequencer. And this is this kind of key moment in history where we move from something that's like an analog biological process to a key piece of technology that allows for digitization. So we're now moving from a chemical biological process to bioinformatics, to zeros and ones. This is this moment where we have this 
this recombination, this melding of two different disciplines and moving into the world of computer science. This is the first time it happens. Uh, we also have the creation of something called polymerase chain reaction. You can think about this like if I have a piece of DNA and it's kind of a finite resource, but with this technology that was created by Kerry Mullis, who was again awarded a Nobel and passed away recently, RIP, he was able to amplify and create more of the DNA itself by playing with its chemical structure. Very important key technologies. Then we have the publication of a paper looking at mitochondrial genome diversity and understanding that based on this information, we really get to understand and have a higher resolution look for the first time at the diaspora and migratory history of human beings, starting in Africa and out uh, into the rest of the world. Finally, uh, we all know we ended up in, in, in Hawaii and Polynesia some time ago during the Austronesian diaspora, but really connecting a lot of these ideas around history and archaeology and linguistics and, and, and oral histories of, uh, based on communities and combining all of those threads to support what we know about human history and, and this addition to this piece of genetics. For the first time, we know that the mitochondrial genome is only inherited on the maternal side from the mom, right? So my mom is Hawaiian, so I have mitochondrial DNA from Hawaii right? And even farther back. Pretty cool feature, pretty cool way to understand where we've come from. We then, though, in 1987, have something called the Slack Farm Dickinson Mound looting. So in, in 1987, looting of a 500-year-old burial mound in Kentucky uh, reveals that people are stealing human remains. These are uh, these are iwi snatchers. They're snatching people's bones up. They're grave robbers. Uh, we will get back to this idea of ancient genetics and ancient genomics and the potential to derive mm -hmm. DNA from ancient samples going back as far as 50,000 to, in some cases, even 700,000 years ago in our next lecture. Um, but it's a very key, important piece of, of, of policy that comes out of this, and it's called NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Repatriation and Protection Act. And we'll it's a, a very important law around protecting our ancestors and allowing them to rest in peace. Then as we move from the 1990s to the 2000s, things really speed up. We have sort of the first entry point for something called the Human Genome Diversity Project. And this has been labeled by a number of different groups and people all over the world as something called helicopter research. That is, you parachute into a community, maybe a remote community in the middle of the Amazon or the Tuamotus or the Himalayas, and you collect people's DNA, and then you leave. And they receive nothing for that. People in academic institutions all over the world make their careers on this. Maybe they put their kids in private school. They achieve tenure. They buy a Tesla. They buy a home. Um, and they build their whole career on extracting genetic information from indigenous people. This obviously upset people all over the world. And you have two different takes. You have one of the first indigenous people to achieve a PhD in human genetics by the name of Frank Dukapu. He was a Hopi man. And he said, this is more than the human, this is more than what's wrong with the human genome diversity project. This is a continuation of biocolonialism, a continuation of colonialism and the residue of that. And this is just the exact same scenario, but on a different scale, cloaked and blinded and, and, and other things. And then you have uh, the head lawyer for this from Stanford University saying, you know, we overlooked the ethics for the Human Genome Diversity Project. There were no indigenous people put in positions of leadership huge error, huge error in terms of the way we develop projects and think about designing projects. In the, and, and this was a, a major moment in terms of communities standing up for themselves and their, their interests around extracting DNA and biopiracy. Um, at the same time, a few years later in 1998 in Aotearoa, you have 
this case of what I call let the people come to you science. So the HGDP project is a, a horrible failure in a lot of ways. Uh, um, but this project was actually quite successful. And members, the McLeod family, who is Maori, reached out to members of the University of Otago Medical School. And they said, look, we have really, really high rates of gastric cancer. And we think that it's inherited. We think that there's something heritable behind this. Is there any way that you can take a peek into our genetics, our genome, and tell us if we could have targeted treatment, or if there's something specific we can do to adjust the way that we, we treat gastric cancer. And this project was wildly successful. They discovered a new gene that could be used to predict and prevent gastric cancer in all populations of people broadly. And they even included members of the McLeod family who worked in the hospital in the author list in the journal Nature, which is a marquee scientific journal. This uh, had never really been done before up to this point. I mean, this is a huge achievement, both scientifically and ethically, and thinking about the way that communities receive and perceive genetic research. So as we move from to the 2000s to the 2010s, things start to go to warp speed. We have the creation and sequencing of the first human chromosome in 1999. Then the Human Genome Project is a massive success in 2001. Billions of dollars go into this large scale government initiative. It is heralded as the future of medicine. We then have the HapMap Project where three populations of people are sequenced, one from Nigeria, one Caucasian population from Utah, and a final population of um, Han Chinese individuals from uh, Beijing. And then by 2008, you have something called the Thousand Genomes Project, where 2,504 individuals are sequenced from 25 different populations. And we're starting to sort of cobble together a representation, a very small fraction of the full spectrum of human genetic variation. But a look into our past that, that has some really interesting features to it, and many of which allow for us to build projects around predictive and preventative medicine with these uh, reference panels of diversity. It's really important. Um, and then in 2010, you have the emergence of ancient genomics. And again, we'll get to that next week, but I just wanted to kind of couch that historically. Now, uh, and forgive me uh, if anyone is uh, averse to seeing ancient remains, but I wanted to use this moment in 2005, the National uh, Genographic Project, where the, the human, you know, National Geographic reached out to communities with a direct-to-consumer test. That is, they would send a tube to your house, you would spit in it, and then you would send the tube back to them. They would sequence it or use an array-based technology, and then they would kind of tell you what you already know about your, your genealogy and your ancestry. Now, not surprisingly, this wasn't very successful in terms of recruiting diverse amounts of people into this project. And if you look at this pamphlet, this note that that came with that test, you can see that which, which indigenous communities would ever participate in something in which you put multiple skulls. Uh, these are people's ancestors. This is not the right way to engage diverse communities of people. This document itself is colonial. This document itself represents the interest of those that are trying to extract uh, people's DNA. So I just wanted to show this to show you what, what, what when, when commercial interests are at play at foot and they're trying to enter the genomic space, what does it look like? What did the origin of look, that look like? This happened well before the creation of 23andMe or Ancestry.com, for example. Um, and this is some of the propaganda <laughs> that came out from that. Um, I just wanted to play a clip so you can hear how this version of community engagement went down and why it's so problematic. So take a listen. So you're basing this on the genetic trail? Exactly. <laughs> now these people who were in Australia, they mainly were more together as a, a group, you know, like- More cohesive. More cohesive and- uh, There are lots of different populations in Australia, speaking uh -huh. very different languages. They have different cultures, okay. different myths. Why do you call something that uh, the people will tell you they met? as opposed to an experience that they had and they relive it over and over, rather than calling it a myth, would be able to call it something else because 
But I, I have a real strong feeling yeah. about that. That, you know, if you call something a myth, it's a substandard event that does not that's, that's have. So, so in this, in this video, you see this guy, Spencer Wells, who's a doctor from Stanford University, go to Canyon Duchesne in Navajo Nation and try to tell this community where they're from in the most rude way possible. It's uh, quite appalling. It's embarrassing. And this is probably the worst case scenario of what what community engagement can look like. I think personally that these Diné community members really handled this nicely. They were very respectful given uh, the way that this gentleman tried to challenge their origin story. And this is the type of friction that exists. This, this friction, although this was in 2005, this, this type of friction still exists with the way that uh, scientists are trained at you know, elite medical schools all over the world, you know, the Harvards, the Stanford's, the University of Washington, all of these places. So it's something to think about. Um, around that same time, though, we have the Havasupai tribe versus Arizona State. And what happened here was members from Arizona State went to the Havasupai community and they said, look, we recognize that you have really high rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity. And we'd like to sequence your genomes and help you create uh, a path forward in terms of thinking about metabolic disease and the innateness of it and what mutations might exist in your genome that predispose you to disease. And what happened here is, is that they ended up, Arizona State did, using that information to chat one, challenge their origin stories, to predict and think about consanguinity within their community and think about uh, their genetic susceptibility to something called schizophrenia, none of which they had consent for. This results in a lawsuit. This lawsuit resulted in the Havasupai tribe settling out of court. But the major dominoes that fell after this were the Navajo Nation, the largest community in Turtle Island, ends up putting a genetic moratorium on research. And this kind of ripple effect uh, affects the way that people participate in the future of medicine in that sense. So you see like one bad actor and event results in changing the whole culture of collaboration with indigenous communities and research institutions broadly, that is the federal government and academia. Um, so, so traveling from, from 2010 to 2020 now, we get to the interplay of many different museums that are holding indigenous remains and brokering deals uh, because our ancestors exist in cold steel drawers in places like the Smithsonian and the, you know, the British Museum and dare I even say it, the, the Bishop Museum. So you see the interplay and the negotiating of our ancestors remains in a very strange way where communities are not consulted. And we'll get to this in depth again next week. Um, as we move into the present and we take a critical look at the NIH's All of Us Research Program, I want to think of, to have us think about the pros and the cons of these large scale government initiatives. So in 2015, uh, President Barack Obama, then president, wanted to fund a large scale project uh, for billions of dollars with a capital B to sequence 1 million people's uh, genomes in the United States of America. And there's an emphasis on recruitment of low income communities of color who are underrepresented in medical research, meaning they want to oversample for the communities of people that have uh, not been included in me medicine traditionally. Remember at the top of this talk, I told you that there's this innate bias that exists, that the vast majority of people's genomes that have been sequenced are of European ancestry. So on the surface, it seems like a really good thing. It seems like something we need, but this is the illusion of inclusion. And I wanna tell you why. Um, the, the main reason is because it's not culturally sustainable. They're not thinking about what it looks like to include indigenous people in leadership positions in the development of these large scale projects. And they're not thinking about indigenous data sovereignty at all. So 
One thing that has happened with including underrepresented minority populations in, in the future of medicine and allowing us to sequence a diverse, you know, diverse amounts of communities and peoples, what you see is you see mutations that result because of global uh, adaption. So let me give you a few examples that are very interesting. One of them that has resulted is here in the Himalayas. And you can see this gene EPAS1. Um, there's a mutation that is the result of high elevation adaption because Tibetans and Nepalese have been living at high altitude in the Himalayas for something like 10,000 years. They, for that reason, their genomes have adapted and they metabolize oxygen differently than any other community on planet Earth. Um, you also have uh, blood group systems, right? ABO, who knows their, you know, ABO blood group system. We have variation in blood group systems because of our arms with race with many different pathogens like malaria and things like this. You have a, a classic example of a gene called HBB, where, where in sub-Saharan Africa, you have the evolution of an adaption of something called sickle cell disease to reduce the surface area of red blood cells so that malaria parasites cannot uh, infect individuals. So in the sense of like, we are the Aina, the Aina is us. It directly influences our genome over time. This is something that our ancestors have said for a long time. And there is another mutation that was recently discovered in Polynesia called CREBRF. And there's quite a bit of controversy about this one. And we're going to wait till week three to talk about that. But these mutations are starting to pop up all over the place. They are globally rare, but locally common amongst indigenous communities. And this is very, very interesting to big pharma companies like Glasgow Smith Klein, Regeneron, et cetera, because they know that they can utilize these mutations, for example, that 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 could be used to develop the next metformin or the next Viagra or um, understand our susceptibility to the COVID-19 pandemic, for example. You can literally use human genetic variation to fast track the development of blockbuster drugs. And that's exactly what Regeneron is doing. They're working with and stacking the deck for genetic diversity by working with geographically isolated and sequestered populations of people they are utilizing that information to identify mutations and develop new drugs like pesky nine inhibitors. This is a new class of cholesterol drugs that was developed using mutations that were identified in black and African American communities. So you see these companies are mining our genomes to develop the next generation of blockbuster drugs. And if that information is not protected, then it's easily taken over the goal line by Big Pharma. So think about it. If we have a large scale government initiative where 1 million people's genomes become publicly available, that results in open access to that data. If that access is open, then that data gets aggregated and used to predict and model and harmonize and infer and impute all the, all the lovely um, computer science terms that people like to use, uh, the next generations of drugs. Do you think that these community members are going to get a percentage of the proceeds, the royalties, the intellectual property, or even subsidized access to the drugs that are created through these collaborations? No, not a single dime. And so because of that, we've been thinking deeply about a new field that focuses on controlling interests in data, including digital sequence information. Now, let's go back to 2001. When the human genome was initially sequenced, the number one commodity on planet Earth was oil. That was the most important traded commodity. That does not reflect what the number one commodity on planet Earth is today in 2020. It's data itself, raw data itself, including big data from human genome sequences is the number one commodity on planet Earth. That is why Amazon.com is giant and Facebook and Google, et cetera, because that is the source, that is the resource itself. 
we've literally been using terms to describe the way we sift through data as data mining. We are literally data mining genomes. And we have been thinking about and published this paper recently, thinking about how to recognize indigenous rights and interests in raw data and digital sequence information within open access environments. We've been thinking about ways of how to share this information and collaborate around ethical access and use in ways that are consistent with indigenous sovereignty and existing protocols. And finally, how to negotiate equitable outcomes for the use of digital sequence information, including the potential for commercialization. Um, a lot of this is rooted in the UN's Nagoya Protocol. The UN's Nagoya Protocol is a very interesting idea and it has to do with access and benefit sharing. And it kind of works like this. Benefit sharing is the action of giving portions of advantages or profits derived from the use of human genetic resources to the resource providers in order to achieve justice. So let me give you some examples because there's precedent for this. Uh, in South Africa, the San and Khoi communities have worked with the South African government and the United Nations to think about biodiversity and rooibos tea profits, and they've created a circular economic infrastructure so that they receive percentages of royalties from a lot of the benefits and the sharing of those benefits from the, the sale of rooibos tea profits. Another great example, and which has been transformative for a country in Africa called Botswana is the, the trade and sale of diamonds. So 5% of proceeds from the sale of these massive diamonds and diamond mining, we all know is probably the most extractive industry on planet earth besides oil. Um, and they are receiving 5% of the proceeds from diamond mining and they're reinvesting that into cultural revitalization programs. They're reinvesting that in their language. They're reinvesting that in their history, their health, their education. And this has been transformative. In the 80s, they were one of the, you know, economically most hard hit countries in Africa. Now they're one of the most prosperous. And a lot of it has to do with utilizing ideas around benefit sharing. Uh, I wrote a piece about this in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I talked about approaches to equitable benefit sharing with regards to human genome sequence data and in indigenous communities, saying that there are path forward, there are paths forward that are rooted in indigenous data sovereignty within communities that allow for the potential for equitable benefit sharing. And you guys can uh, check that out in the future. Um, and finally, I just wanted to end with this because this uh, actually came out today, but it's a paper talking about COVID-19 and strengthening the push for indigenous data control. So due to data control concerns, tribal nations are not part of the All of Us program in a lot of ways, the DNA collection programs. But that also means that they're missing out on COVID-19 antibody testing. So there's a lot of conflict and friction around uh, uh, paths towards self-governance around data access and diagnostic testing. It's not that most indigenous communities are anti-science or anti-data, but we're pro sovereignty and control, right? So you want to have access to and control of that data and decide who has access to that data. Again, there's a piece that just came out on this from a Navajo gentleman by the name of Kaylin Goodluck, and that is in Wired Magazine. I recommend you guys check that out. Um, and finally, we are really thinking about this in a way to create solidarity with many different indigenous communities uh, from around the world so that we can all share the benefits of genome sequencing and the future of medicine. Um, we actually had our first indigenous genomics conference with all indigenous speakers in Waikato Aotearoa. So there is, um, a, there is, there is a momentum and a, and a movement toward the, the next generation of genome scientists that are really thinking about a lot of these issues. And I wanted to leave you with two questions. Um, we can address them now, or you can think about them later, um, bring them up with your Ohana and others. And one of those questions is, should all genetic data be open to the public? If so, why? And the second is, do you support the NIH's All of Us program? And if so, why? Mahalo Nui, and I'm looking forward to fielding some of these questions. So 
so um, mahalo, <laughs> Ke alu. And, and all your family here in Molokai and, and Oahu, uh, Ke Alu, um, mm. Fox and, and uh, Leslie Fox and all the foxes here. <laughs> So, so um, I just want to make sure that um, there's some follow-up, and I'm going to kind of like uh, mahalo you and, and Leah Dossett and, and kind of like the young generation just bringing us up to uh, spar. <laughs> so, Joanne. Yes. Um, Kialu, thank you so much to you and Leah. I mean, it's so, you know, I kind of marketed this as a provocative a presentation and discussion and it's so beyond but thank you it's so nice to just get more insight to this and how knowledgeable you both are thank you thank you i do have a question from rosie aligado your buddy uh, she says, he says gail would you be in favor of big pharma personalized medicine for specific ethnic communities if there was subsidized access to these medicines i guess this is just one example of an equitable outcome I've seen so many studies where medical treatments overlooked diverse communities and then dosages were based on narrow parameters, usually white males. Raja, Rosie, Rosie, excellent question, comment, series of ideas. Yes, I mean, I think that at some level, um, subsidized access is just, it's like what we deserve. If you think about the development of certain drugs like Vertex, this is a, uh, a cystic fibrosis drug that's hit the market that's $300,000 a year. This drug was derived using sequence information from patients that have cystic fibrosis. They refined it and then they sold it back to the patients. That's Heva, I don't care who you are. So I, I think that that's a step in the right direction, I definitely. Um, and I think we just need to be more creative about the ways that we think about access and, and drugs and just providing providing treatment options and and really thinking about how broken our healthcare system is um, and acknowledging that. So, but thank you for the comment, mahalo nui. So, um, Kilo, I have, a, I have a question, a comment. Um, you know, when we were just getting involved in research uh, before you were born, I <laughs> <laughs> You know, we were on the learning curves to just trying to develop, um, now they call it community-based participatory research, but just equity and fairness and respect in community research. And, you know, shout out to Emmett because they were taking stands like, no, we have to own the data. Even though people were saying it was illegal, you can't do that. No, we have to include, um, we have to include part of the intended audiences in authorship, in jobs, you know, really helped to shape what we did at Papa Ololokahi as well. So, you know, I, I keep telling Emmett, and I used to tell Kekuni this, is we need our activists back on the front line. Um, you clearly are in that pool with uh, Leah. But where can we advocate for things that, you know, we're not going to get support for, but it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I, uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I definitely think that like one of the most amazing things about getting to speak with our whole Lahui about, about, about all of these issues is that it's activating people and they're going to talk to other people in the community about these ideas and, and how they're, they're wrong and how, um, how there are other paths forward for more equitable health outcomes and that we should want more and that settling for the status quo and not finding ways to disrupt it is, uh, you know, that's average. That's not us, you know? Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Dr. Kamaka. She, oops, uh, her question is, can you discuss models of indigenous genetic data banks? I believe Aboriginal Australia has these do we have the infrastructure to support this? Right on, yeah, great question. I think there are three that are new that I really like. So she alludes to the one in Australia. Um, that's interesting. Uh, the one I think that has the most upside is the Native Biodata Consortia that's on Cheyenne River. That's completely 
just independent, run and operated on the reservation. They are in complete control. You know, the vertical stack of technologies from, from the freezers that the DNA is stored in to the genome sequencers on site to the end-to-end -end encryption for computation to the legal oversight. Like it's a very different model. And I think that's one option. There are also nested options. University of British Columbia has something with a lot of the First Nations there. And it's a nested biobank within the university. That's also an option. But I just would say that there are tons of different uh, flavors, but it's all about the context of what the community needs and, and how we build consensus around that. Um, but yeah, but good I, question. I completely agree with you, Kiolu, in terms of, you know, community stakeholders and building a consensus. I think that's really going to be important, you know, in terms of moving forward. And I think, you know, as a community, um, we may not always agree, right? I have <laughs> a, you know, you know, uniform you know, when it comes to uniform decision making, I, I know that's always a challenge, but you know, one of the things that we think about in terms of infrastructure to support this is yes, you know, um, we have a lot of Kanakamoli who are interested in genomics and genetics and, you know, this type of science, but I think uh, acknowledging that we certainly need to talk about the the education of our Kiki who are coming up right into, you know, high school and thinking about higher levels of education and what that might look like. I think, you know, um, we have the opportunity to kind of turn that around and really build our future accordingly. Yes. So, so, so um, if I can, I'm just looking how genomics can connect us to our linear ancestors, rather than to have to dig into, you know, DNA bones or, or whatever. Um, can? No can. 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 There's, there are a lot of new technologies that are available. I think, again, having these conversations and understanding what is actually possible is so important. Because if we are not, again, having these conversations, then by the time people come in, these thieves and these museums, we, you know, we, we have no idea that it's happening, but there are emerging technologies now that are non-invasive that allow for the sequencing of like a Neanderthal's genome in, from the soil, the sediment and soil from a meter away from the actual remains. That means that you could have a genealogical connection to the Aina itself. That's a powerful idea for our communities that could be used in ways that really are resulting in repatriation of land, title to land and revitalization of, of our culture. On the other hand though, if used by the wrong community, it could end up with relinquishing control of that data because we're not the ones that are processing that information. We're not the ones that are controlling what's going on. So it's a, it's a dangerous double-sided sword. But as long as we understand what the potential is and have those conversations, and again, build that consensus, I think that's, that's the future. Keolu, if I may, you know, speaking of new technologies yeah. and how that might tie into, you know, ancient genomics, et cetera, mm -hmm. would you be willing to share a little bit about your most recent award? Yes. Oh, yeah, I can. Oh, yes. Um, Mahalo Nui, first of all, for one, uh, we were in a contest called the MIT SALT for Indigenous Communities. We won the community prize. And a lot of it is because of your support, our Lahui support, everyone who's voted for our project to safeguard Indigenous genomics. It means a lot just because I, I know that's what the, the, our people want. We want to protect our ancestors. And we've developed a number of ideas and technologies to do this. And we appreciate the support. It's awesome to, again, get to work with people from our community on issues that we're prioritizing. So all of the aloha and just love that's outpoured from that has been incredible. So 
Mahalo Nui again. Can't say thank you enough. Um, I have a question from uh, Chase Maleta. Uh, I'm a third year resident in anatomic and clinical pathology at UCSD. Mm -hmm. As you know, much of the facilitation of clinical molecular slash genetic testing is within the scope of the pathologist's practice. I've been thinking a lot of how I can be a steward of genetic sovereignty while balancing the use and need for more and more genetic information for improved clinical outcomes. Can you comment on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, um, Chase, I think it was, thank you so much, you know, for kind of talking about that. I, I think the idea of stewardship is really important. You know, um, like Kilu was kind of making references to having, you know, a double-edged sword, you know, for us as Alahui, you know, as Kalakamaole, we want to have health equity and we want to have benefits from genomic sequencing right again this is a new era that we're moving into and all of you know the data all the benefits from that all the drugs all the your treatment all that um better management better surveillance right we want to take that information and translate it to patient care i think in order to do that having our genomes available, right? Having that data and that access to um, maybe an indigenous biobank per se, or even participating or having a seat at the table with the proper oversight and being, you know, again, a part of the conversation from the beginning to prevent biocolonialism. Um, I think it, it's, it's hard, right? Again, we want to participate. We want to be able to, again, get all this benefit from sequencing and how we can kind of use this for medicines to help right or better understand disease and only and how that interacts with the environment and our aina but it's going to take our willingness to kind of have our data looked at right in order to get those types of results what do you think Keolo? oh i think you hit it on the nose i mean i it, in terms of like basic things that you can do uh chase you can uh you know, set up a journal club in UCSD. I happen to be an assistant professor here. I'm happy to help you uh, and and create and keep the momentum going so that people are aware of all of these emerging issues, that the whole field is evolving and it's evolving towards something that's more sustainable. Um, this is Joanne. You know, Keolu, thank you, because I like how you set up the technology and policy and they are not in sync. You're right. <laughs> But I think it does, <laughs> but it does take somebody to make the noise and um, our activists like you uh, to put those issues back on the table because otherwise it's so much driven by funding and money. And um, so I appreciate that. That just really ties into your question, Chase. Uh, and also when, um, when I think about the communities who are, um, who really hold fast to doing things uh, in equitable ways, they know how to say no, even when it's hard, you know, when money is on the table. They know how to say no uh, until it's being done the right way. And that's not easy, never is. Couldn't agree more, Joanne. Yes. I, I was going to piggyback just the idea of this idea of uh, regenerative refusal. It's in Miley Arvin's new book. But it's like, if you give people one door and you say, if you don't go through this door, you're gonna get left behind. But why do we have to go through that door? Why can't we wait for door two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 open up and then take our time and then go through at our pace through those doors? What's wrong with that? Yes. Um, <laughs> the last question is, is someone talking to all of us and NIH about the equity for Kanaka Maori? Mm. Uh, read Kayla's articles. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, uh, I know that there is a lot of comments and pushback out there, not um, a large part from you, Kayla, and your colleagues. I know you work mm. with them quickly, and from uh, Indian country. Uh, I've heard it over the last two years. Um, what I like and I, I applaud and thank you um, is that you are publishing about it. You're being very forthright and we need to keep doing that. And for all of us in the lay audience, we need to support these guys who are at the front line taking this on. 
not easy um, as young scientists. We know it's a, it is a double-edged sword. You have careers to build and we support you in that, but you're also, you know, being the caretakers of, of our um, community. So thank you. So Emmett, I think we are out of time and need to wrap this up. Uh, I was going to ask Keolo as the last question and Liel what people can expect in the next uh, webinar. You gave them a little, you put a little bait in the water already, Keolo, so thank you for that. Um, but maybe just a couple sentences so people know that it's going to be awesome like it was tonight. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, next, not next week, yeah, it's a few weeks, but next. Uh, the 23rd, it's on Friday. The date. Yeah. 23rd, we are going to have a conversation about ancient oh, right We're going to preview the field, take a look at the history again, talk about some of the technologies, talk about what's happening, talk about uh, how more ancient genomes have been sequenced in the first half of 2019 than the entirety of history, and why our field is calling this the bone rush. That's what we're going to talk about. Great. Okay. Emmett, any um, uh, final thoughts? Before we do that, I do want to also again thank our sponsors, Papa Ololokahi, uh, Ahahuyo Nakauka, uh, Leah, the new on the board, uh, Ahakane, who when I asked uh, how they felt about Coast Bronze, they just said, all in, we're in, and uh, uh -huh. Office of Human Affairs. So, um, okay. Uh, Emmett? Okay, he has been having problems going in and out. He's on Molokai, so <laughs> I know he's been off and on on this. Uh, but maybe I'll hand it back over to Kim. Kim, thank you and the staff for uh, running things behind yeah. the scenes. Uh, yes, you thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, mahalo nui to all of you for your uh, for your patience and understanding during this. Um, uh, you guys are just smarter than smart, and we're really thrilled that you're able to share your brilliance with our community. Um, Sandy asked, is somebody talking to the Native Hawaiian community? And this is actually one reason why Papa Ololokahi is presenting this series and an ongoing educational campaign because, um, you know, because of our relationship to the Native Hawaiian Healthcare Improvement Act and being a consultative body for Hawaiian health, we are being pushed and we have been pushed for several years now to take money to uh, promote all of us. And we haven't done that yet because we haven't um, surveyed our community and we cannot survey our community until we provide some information. So this is the very beginning of that process and um, we want to provide as much information as possible. So thanks Sandy for asking that question and for everybody who tuned in, mahalo to our presenters, to Joanne and Emmett who moderated this whole session, to all the attendees who put up with our lack of video. Now we have it, yay, we'll do better next time. Um, mm -hmm. Joanne, you've mahaloed all of the um, sponsors and we look forward to seeing you all back again on October 23rd. Aloha, malama, malama kikahi, kikahi. Aloha. Thanks, Kim. Uh -huh.